welcome to the Scam Economy with your host, Matt Bender. Welcome to Scam Economy, everyone. I am your host, Matt Binder. September is here. The temperatures are getting cooler, but the heat remains in the cryptocurrency world because there is so much going on. And on this episode of the show, we're going to get, I guess we're going to start getting into the spooky season of fall a little bit early because we're bringing you a mystery. Here, right now, today, we're going to attempt to solve a long-standing mystery about the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, Binance, and who actually is in charge and an owner of Binance. Because you see, for a long time, there has been an individual listed on a lot of important documents from Binance that you would normally see some sort of legal rep on or maybe the actual company CEOs or co-founders. But apparently, an individual by the name of Guanyin Chen has long been on these documents and no one seems to know exactly who she is. Now, we're going to get into what Binance says and who Binance says she is. Slight spoiler to explain a little bit more. They claim she's just some low-level staffer there, which really just adds more to the mystery here because, you know, Binance, largest cryptocurrency exchange in the world. Why is this person on these documents? If she's just a low-level staffer, why? If she's actually someone more important in the company, possibly even a, a founder, a co-founder, why are they trying to hide exactly who she is? Just questions and questions and questions, no matter which way it turns, and we will get into it all. There is a mystery to solve here. And before we get into that, my dear Watson, first, patreon.com slash mattbinder to support scam economy and help the show grow youtube.com slash mattbinder for the video version of the program scameconomy.com for the audio version and links to apple Podcasts, spotify to get the podcast version of this show twitch.tv slash mattbinder and youtube.com slash mattbinder to catch the post show whether you want to watch it live call into the show or catch the replay. That's where you go to do that. And it's not every day you get to say you were responsible for the world's largest cryptocurrency exchange, feeling like they were compelled to put out a whole long, I mean, is it really a statement? More like an essay defending themselves from uh, a, a question really. But the person joining me right now uh, is the one who made Binance do just that. Jacob Silverman, a journalist currently writing a book with Ben McKenzie on cryptocurrency, surprisingly, that's uh, currently uh, set to come out next summer. Uh, Jacob, thank you so much for joining me today. Glad to be here. Thanks. And so how does it feel, first of all, to, uh, <laughs> to have... Uh, compelled Binance to have to put out this, I mean, again, I, a statement doesn't seem like it, it gives it the, uh, the what, what it deserves. It was like a long, like written piece, like a piece of journalism without, you know, without any real uh, journalism behind it, I guess. But it was long. <laughs> yeah, I, I was surprised, you know, I mean, at, frankly, as a journalist, it feels kind of good when you're asking some questions and then suddenly the head of the world's biggest crypto exchange decides to write this long, somewhat essayistic and personal uh, piece in response to my questions. I, I, I found it a little strange, you know, and this is something we can talk about throughout, but um, I, I didn't expect that. And I, the level of reaction that I've gotten recently from the company uh, in relation to just asking basically one question uh, about someone who works there it has been um, probably indicative of how they feel about it. And it's been really surprising. Um, so I, I think there's also the the essay, which I'm sure we'll get into, the CZ post. It, it I think, is, is useful because it does say some things about how he sees himself, or at least how he wants people to see him in the company and the kind of story they're trying to tell. Uh, so that's something we can definitely get into. 
Right. So for people who don't know, let's actually, you know, this is definitely, uh, I mean, I love mysteries. And that's what, I mean, true crime is the biggest uh, podcast like genre there is. So people other than myself love mysteries too. And this is a real mystery story because there is uh, multi levels going on here. But before we get into that, I, I think we should go back a little bit and give people who don't know a little bit of background on, on Binance. And you mentioned CZ. And for people who don't know, CZ is what Binance's uh, CEO and uh, as far as we know, and we'll get into a little bit why that's the case uh, in a bit, um, founder of Binance, uh, Chang Pen Zhao. So he goes by CZ for short. Um, who 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 is CZ and uh, what is Binance? Other than I guess I I think if you're a little bit uh, familiar with them, you probably heard of Binance as the the world's largest crypto exchange. But if you're very like U.S. centric in your consumption of this stuff, it's easy to overlook them because they don't have such a strong standing uh, here in the U.S. Like for example, the U.S.'s number one crypto exchange, Coinbase does. That's right. Uh, so Binance is really important, uh, arguably the most important company in crypto. I mean, you could say Tether or something like that, or obviously companies like FTX and Coinbase, Coinbase play huge roles. But uh, in terms of volume of crypto being traded, Binance is the biggest in the world by far. Um, and most of the world uh, really ex trades on Binance. There is a Binance US. It has more limited offerings uh, than just what's called Binance Global sometimes. So a lot of people trade on Binance Global uh, through VPNs if necessary. And Binance does have subsidiaries in a number of countries. But uh, again, the, those sort of local subsidiaries, while sometimes they're operating their own local exchanges and uh, only sometimes in accordance with local law and regulation, uh, they're not really as important as Binance, this global entity. And I think what's unusual about Binance is that it is sort of a distributed or decentralized company in a way. I mean, it has a centralized leadership, but it has no official home. Um, it's it's registered in various places uh, and has a number of subsidiaries and associated companies and possible shell companies and things like that. Um, we know now that it's starting to develop more of a presence in France and in the Middle East. Uh, um, CZ has met with Macron a couple of times they're getting the the relevant sort of licenses there and stuff like that. They're trying to run uh, various asset exchanges for Middle Eastern governments. They're really everywhere, though. I mean, they're doing stuff in Nigeria now on sort of a blockchain free economic zone type thing. So Binance is very significant and they have um, reach everywhere pretty much. And they are involved at the political level a lot. Not that much here in the U.S. CZ himself is probably one of the most famous people in crypto and really a kind of nerd celebrity. A lot of people really like him or, or sort of enjoy him. And uh, he's probably the most impersonated person on Twitter next to Elon Musk, maybe. Right. Um, one, other, <laughs> one other thing that I'd add, and we'll, we'll get more into sort of Binance's leadership, but Binance does have another co-founder, uh, Ye He, or excuse me, Yi He, pardon me. And she's a Chinese woman who recently has been sort of stepped to the fore and been kind of touted more by the company. She didn't have much of a public role before, as, as far as I know, but she's running their venture capital arm, which is really big, has something like $7 billion and uh, has other responsibilities too. So they're, they're kind of uh, touting her and profiling her in media as, as uh, another partner alongside CZ. But the real question with Binance has always been, um, how does it operate? Where does it really operate? It's not really believed to be in China anymore by a lot of people because the, uh, they got kicked out, basically, when China kicked out a lot of crypto companies. Um, and as uh, Binance would tell it, they're basically not allowed in China. They're kind of persona non grata. And that's why they've been kind of stateless. But uh, another necessary uh, note is that there was an article published uh, a year or two ago in in Forbes called the, about something called the Tai Chi document. And the Tai I, Chi document was basically. I, I was going to ask you about this. Yeah, because yeah. this comes up and it's sort of because uh, I was going to ask you actually, like, w what's the reason why Binance is pretty much like the leading crypto exchange 
in every other country, it seems, but the U.S. And it seems like they, the, the, this Tai Chi document you're about to tell us about sort of is, is their, uh, I guess it wasn't supposed to be public, uh, but their way of trying to uh, explain to people in, within the company how they need to change things around uh, so they can be a leader in the U.S., yeah, it, it's arguably a, a kind of Rosetta Stone for how they operate, or at least it seems very revealing. Um, so the Tai Chi document was a leaked internal document that involved a lot of, uh, or at least was presented to senior executives, including, I believe, CZ. And it, it essentially said that they would pursue a deliberate strategy to avoid law and regulation, especially around money transmitting laws, money laundering, know your customer, anti-money laundering laws, things like that. Um and they would do it through uh, shell corporations, through setting up local subsidiaries that were almost kind of Potemkin entities, like say a Binance US that isn't actually used that much. Um, and there was a Tai Chi metaphor employed, which I don't know a lot about Tai Chi, but I think the idea is sort of it's a defensive art based on uh, distraction, misdirection, that kind of thing. And that is potentially what uh, Binance is doing, which is that it, it kind of, uh, says one thing and presents itself one way. I mean, they they're, they have presence all over the place and they say they want to work with local regulators and they meet with a lot of politicians and stuff. But when you really try to figure out uh, where are they based, who owns what, and what are all these companies that seem to be connected to one another, it does start getting more opaque and confusing and just strange at times. Right. And so this leaked document sort of um, – because I, I was looking at it um, uh, before our conversation. and It's sort of like – it seems like the, the reason maybe based on this document that they are not so established in the U.S. is because there are regulations and rules that they would have to follow as an exchange dealing with like the exchange of – of money um, that, yeah. that, that they can't um, – like, like there's certain – Things they can't list in the U.S. as as Coinbase found out the hard way recently, right. um, and so this Tai Chi document seemed to have uh, one of the th other things it seemed to have done was um, sort of promote the idea that once uh, they get someone in the U.S. to use the Binance U.S. version to try to facilitate them into using like the main Binance that they're technically not allowed to use from within the U.S. Right. Um I'm not as familiar with that end of things, but it sure would be in their interest to funnel people to the offshore entity. I mean, in a lot of ways, this isn't that different than what most exchanges do, just not at Binance's tremendous scale. But most of them are offshore or, you know, registered in the Caymans or or um, elsewhere in the Bahamas or Seychelles, Malta, these kinds of places. And they it's in their interest to try to avoid um law and regulation and really also to just not to be without a real jurisdiction and to not have to have sophisticated uh, what are called KYC AML uh, for people who don't know uh, know your customer anti-money laundering uh, programs which are standard at banks and most financial institutions and it's a constant sort of uh, question in the industry which is how much KYC AML are some of these companies doing we know that some of them do almost none and people ha have already you know been arrested for that kind of thing or gone to jail um, arguably there hasn't been enough enforcement but so this kind of uh, jurisdiction hunting and trying to avoid uh, oversight or jurisdiction in general it is a deliberate strategy I think according to the Tai Chi Tai Chi document and it is something that a lot of exchanges do and I think it's pretty self-evident uh, one other note uh, that I think also is important is that after this article is published, the Tai Chi document Forbes, they sued Forbes, they sued the reporter. Uh, somewhere a few months later, they dropped the lawsuit. A little while after that, they announced that they were taking a huge share uh, or huge ownership share in Forbes. Uh, so, you know, that, that kind of stuff, that also seems like a, a certain, you can see maybe some decision making behind that. There has been also some reporting since that maybe the Forbes deal won't be what we thought it was, but then they said they're still buying some of it. So we'll have to see what happens. 
Right, right. I told. I was reading it like literally, like late last night. Uh, the Forbes piece about the uh, Tai Chi document, and, and they were the ones who broke it. Uh, Michael Del Castillo over at uh, Forbes. This was uh, late uh, October 2020, so just little, little less than uh, two years ago now. Um, and I totally forgot that Binance had like bought a huge stake in. Forbes. <laughs> I wonder yeah. if this was uh, one of the pieces that sort of uh, pushed them towards uh, towards doing yeah. that. Yeah, I mean, yeah. one if the deal—I don't know the status of the deal—but if it's ever fulfilled, I mean, I really wonder if that article will stay online. Right, right. And on top of that, like combining this with what you just said earlier about how like Binance's internals, like what we know about them and their business dealings, are so like. Uh, you know, opaque and, and, you know, all over the place. Um, just last episode, I was speaking of the show of scam economy. I was speaking with Molly white and we were just going through like some of the most ridiculous crypto stories that happened over this past summer. And, um, one of the stories we, we touched on was actually, uh, that Indian based, uh, that India based, uh, crypto exchange, like Wazir X, where yep. uh, they got in trouble with uh, uh, Indian authorities over there. And uh, it came out that, oh, look, uh, people realized all these articles written years ago. Like, oh, look, Binance acquired, acquired Wazir X uh, a while ago. And I, I guess this is a Binance company. Um, and then CZ came out and claimed that, no, we don't have anything to do with Wazir X, even though like they were prominently mm -hmm. exclaiming that they acquired this company along with all those articles about the acquisition. <laughs> yeah, and I looked into that a little bit. Uh, I tweeted about it some. I didn't end up writing about it, but um, it was that was another revealing incident, you know, for as long. And it's just, I mean, typically in crypto, as long as things are going well, um, everything's fine. But then, you know, it, it's kind of the blame game begins um, when something goes wrong. But as long as things are going well, Binance held itself out as the owner of Wazir X. They call they referred to it in in their own publications on their website as Binance owned. Uh, CZ tweeted that they owned it um, last year. So you know now when when basically Wazir X was starting to be looked at by Indian regulators, CZ said, "Oh, the deal never went through because they were uncooperative." Wazir X said, uh, "No, Binance wouldn't tell us where they were re-registering or something like that as a corporate entity." Or what the name of the corporate entity was, but we are. But they claim that everything was controlled by Binance. Like de Binance was the de facto owner and controlling entity. Um, Binance was also trying to say that no, they maybe had an interest in this associated entity. I think I forget it started with a Z. Um, but it really does sound like you know Binance was in charge in some way. Maybe the legal status might be murky, but. They at least held themselves out and seemed to control things. Yeah, right. So I, I think we've uh, I think I've uh, given everyone enough background on Binance and also people who already knew all this about Binance. I'm sure I've tortured them with this tease enough. Uh, so now let's get into the mystery here. Can you share with us? Your, I think it was only what, probably uh, a couple of words. Your tweet <laughs> that set off this entire uh, thing from Binance, where they felt they needed to put out a long form essay uh, answering your question and mentioning you uh, in the article multiple times without mentioning your name, though. The ultimate, the ultimate slap in the face, referring to you over and over again, but not mentioning your name. Oh, that really would bother me. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I don't know. I was sort of told that, you know, I wasn't I was I got a heads up right before it was published and I was told, oh, you aren't named or attacked directly or attacked, but uh, your reference. And so uh, I don't know. I took that as a, as a way of just not trying to be too inflammatory or make it about me, which is fine. Um, right. I would have been but, like, put some respect on my name. <laughs> you went all out of this way because of me and everyone should know. <laughs> that's fair. That's fair. I, I, I feel a little bit of that maybe. But, you know, I, I don't, I just think it's important that people are asking this question. So the question is, who is Guan Yang Chen? And I've asked this a couple of times on Twitter, not a lot, but I've tweeted at CZ 
And then what happened was, um, I'm losing track of time, but a week or two ago, I was, t- I was tweeting with people and I started going back and forth a bit with um, uh, Patrick Hillman, who's the head of comms for finance. And uh, I, <laughs> we were talking about media bias or something like that. Um, I don't know. He, he said I was a little too critical of Binance and not enough of FTX, which I don't know. I, I've got stuff on FTX coming down the road later. It's fine. Um, but, you know, j- whatever. Um, there's plenty to go around for yeah, all these so crypto exchanges. Yeah, there's so much in this industry and Binance is the biggest entity. So, of course, I'm going to pay some attention to it. But um, anyway, um, I don't I don't take charges of favoritism that seriously because I'm you know, I'm, I'm a pretty confirmed crypto skeptic, but... You mean, um, hold on, hold on, uh, Jacob, you mean to tell me that Sam Bankman-Fried is, is not paying you to go after Binance? You're not secretly <laughs> in FTX's pocket? <laughs> De- definitely not, definitely not. Um, yeah, um, they he's always an think guy, they, though. They always think something like that. You see these charges. At, Molly White's been getting it a lot recently because she, she, she dared to launch a Patreon after like Web3 yeah. is going great success. And I get it every now and then because I have a Patreon too, but I'm not – Scam Economy is, is not at Web3 is going great levels yet. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, well, but that's but the thing though like because everything these... is pay to play in crypto. So they're right. all on the take. So they assume that we have to be too even though there's no money in what we're, we're doing. That's so perfectly put. Like that's literally it. Like they think that oh, it this is how it works for us, so I guess it's got to work that way for them. Who would be who would run their lives and their their financials with a set of morals? How is that even a possibility? I mean, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, you know, there's definitely corrupt media out there, but it's nothing like what's imagined that like someone is from FTX is sponsoring uh or is is basically uh, putting Reuters up to these supposed hit pieces on Binance. That's just not how it works. And and I know that's not how it works in this situation. But anyway, so the the to really get to it, um, Guanying Chen is the name of, uh, believed to be the name of a Chinese woman who uh, is on some important Binance corporate documents. So we're talking uh, basically corporate registration documents for Binance and associate entities, both in China and elsewhere. And there are different theories, which we we can get into to varying degrees. We don't need to speculate too much because I think what's important is just that the question is really just the basic thing is, who is Guanying Chen? And this is what I asked Patrick Hellman on, on Twitter, and this is what seemingly precipitated this. And why is this person listed as a director and sometimes a sole director or owner of Binance affiliates, meaning... Um, companies that are part of Binance or that own parts of the Binance company. Um, and no one really knows the answer to this question. And Binance has never answered it publicly. What did what did we know about this this person, Guanying Chen, before uh, you asked this question and they put out this like sort of explainer? Like did we was there even like a any idea of who this individual could have been? Like did was was there a, an understanding of like this was a, a somebody in the company, a founder maybe, or someone who maybe was was previously had a bigger role and left or something like that? Like what what did we know? Like like and, and how many and like was this a question that was going and how long I should ask this. And how long was this question going around for? Sure. Well, I, I could tell you most of that, but I, I don't know exactly how long. But, you know, there is a website. It's called something like Scam Binance or Binance Scam dot com or something like that. Um, CZ referred to it and said it was by a competitor. I believe it's actually associated with one of the lawsuits against, against Binance. Um, there is some information on there about Guanying Chen. That is, but, you know, in sort of typical crypto fashion, they encourage you to DYOR and like look up who this person is. But, there, you know, there's the writing is a bit of a mess, but there's just screenshots of corporate registrations and things like that on there that are probably worth looking at. But you can look up public databases of various corporate registries and find information on this person. But there was no official story of who this person was. And as far as I know, um, I think in sort of Internet circles, it's been going around for a year or two, at least maybe longer. But no one no one really ever addressed this in any formal sense. Uh, and had so that I would argue that's why this has be, kind of become a big deal and why it's led to some of the conspiracizing that CZ complains about, which is that 
you know, the accusations are that Binance is a Chinese company and it's controlled by Chinese intelligence or that um, this per this Guanning Chen person is sort of a, a, a hidden founder or the, the connection to the Chinese state, something like that. I have no idea. Um, you know, it does seem like Binance got kicked out of China. But the big question is, why is this person seemingly have a lot of legal ownership over aspects of Binance? Right. So, so you simply basically uh, one of uh, it seems like at least a few. I'm looking at this uh, website you mentioned. Um, I think I did come across this myself. It is called scambinance.com, and they have a whole piece, uh, a lot of screenshots, like you mentioned, uh, titled "Who Owns Binance Casino?" Guanying yeah. Chen, and in parentheses, I, I guess sh uh, she goes by uh, Hina Chen as well. Or, yeah, so that that is the name she goes by apparently, um, on right. a, sort of with friends or colleagues. Right, or Cheng Pen Zhao, uh, Zhao, <laughs> and um, uh, from what I understand, um, based on what's been already found out before you asked this question to them, um, basically it seems like CZ had this like company before Binance, a non crypto company, uh, called like BG Tech or something like that. And she was part of that, uh, maybe one of the early uh, employees, and had a role in administration or something like that. And when he started Binance, according to what was out there before, again, you asked the question, um, they needed a Chinese national, and CZ claims he's uh, Canadian and and. Had doesn't have any ties to China anymore, which again we'll get into more in a bit. Um, and to make things easier, when they were trying to run in China, they need to have a Chinese national on. And so this woman, who he had a working relationship with based on his previous company, uh, Guanying Chen, was the the best person to be the name on these filings and forms. That's it, exactly. What, Right. That's what we knew. Uh, you, know, you just uh, laid down some of it. Uh, this scam Binance site laid a, down a little bit of background, too. So you asked the question. And how did you a ask it exactly? It was, it was just simply like uh, you added him, uh, not CZ. Uh, who did you uh, reply to again? Pa uh, Patrick Hillman, the head of communications for Binance. And, you know, I was being a little cheeky, but I said, while I have you here, who's Guan Ying Chen? And that's what CZ quoted in his post. Um <laughs> But, how many how many characters is that? That's like less than a hundred, right? Jeez. I don't know, but yeah. Uh, so um, this 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 blog that they put out. I guess we should get into this now. So that simple tweet from you asking a a fairly straightforward and not all that surprising question based on what we what's already out there. Like this is something you think internally, even though they haven't put out anything really substantial about this issue, this mystery. Uh, publicly yet, you think internally, being that this question was going around for so long, they would have had a, a, a response ready to go for when it would arise. Uh, and they put out this essay on their blog, Binance.com, and um, the title of this statement is, Who is Guanyang Chen and is Binance a, and in quotation marks, Chinese company, end quote. So, Jacob, tell us a little bit about what Binance gets into in this essay about really, I guess they, they decided to cover both these issues here in one. I guess it was a, uh, a way to, for them to, to kill two birds with one stone. Um, go ahead. Right. So, yeah, I never asked if Binance was a Chinese company or really implied any nefarious associations with the Chinese state. I mean, let's be honest. China and companies that are at least started there, um, the state often has a role or influence over people. It's not a very free society. But, you know, I, I don't have any specific ideas or accusations about that. Um, but I think, yeah, he took the opportunity to sort of address that question and kind of lump in mine and maybe excuse my question as this uh, honestly kind of perhaps a racist or xenophobic question because according to what CZ wrote and what he's expressed, he feels that he's um, a Canadian national, Chinese Canadian. He moved to, to Canada with his family as a child from China and that he sort of gets unfairly tagged as uh, an untrustworthy Chinese person who is head of this Chinese exchange 
that has Chinese government ties. So um, from that perspective, you, you can understand perhaps um, you know, why there's a certain defensiveness and things like that. I mean, there are some things that you can't really dispute, which is that uh, CZ did business in China for a while and started the company in China uh, before uh, they were forced to leave. But um, I, and I can't really say much beyond that. Right. But yeah, he was there for a while, and they had uh, Chinese presence, Chinese uh, employees, some of whom did flee with the with the with the company. I mean, I'm uh, my understanding is that Guan Ying Chen was really just, uh, and this is not to diminish her or anything like that, but she was some sort of low level administrator, sort of an executive assistant type, and she did eventually flee with the company. Um, and we should and say now, they, they they fleed because um, China started to crack down on cryptocurrency. Yeah, I mean, there's some sort of I, I would have to look into this more, but there's some sort of argument or notion that it's more than that. It's some some Binance executives might be considered criminals in China uh, or have broken certain laws. Okay. I don't know. Uh, um there's some of them. I know that people there aren't keen to, to ever go to China, um, at least how it's been expressed. Right. And um, so, you know, that is an open question, which is pro which is probably important. But I just I ha haven't even really gotten to it yet, which is, you know, what is what is the status with the Chinese state or um, or their legal status there? You know, and why, and also, you know, why did Binance and some of these other exchanges get kicked out, but other other foreign exchanges seem to be able to operate there? I think that's also a a, a worthy question too. So, you know, it, it's a murky world um, when you're dealing with sort of offshore finance and crypto, but um, that's the story that they tell, and that Guan Yin Chen was someone who who left the country and now is a resident of a European unnamed European country. You know, it could be France because they have a, a growing presence there. I, you know, I'm not trying to dox this person, but I, I did post uh, some corporate documents. I covered up uh, revealing information, but uh, I don't think it, it's inappropriate to say that some documents say that Guan Yin Chen is, uh, was a Singapore citizen or had some sort of Singapore residency. Um, but the, you know, the, the point is that by any measure, Guan Yin Chen uh, was... A director of some sort or owned uh, early Binance companies. And the question is, why do you do this? And why, you know, it, CZ was, a, was a, a businessman, a savvy guy. Like, China is not some backwater. You can get a lawyer or someone from, or someone perhaps at a more senior level or even an ownership level. Uh, it, I think it is strange because you're you're granting legal rights to this person. Now, one of the things that I've heard some people claim, I have to confirm this because uh, some of the documents are in Chinese, but um, some people think that through the BJ Tech, the sort of predecessor of Binance, Guan Ying Chen actually owns almost all of Chinese Binance, of whatever Chinese IP and uh, Binance has and some and other parts of Binance. I don't really know if that number is accurate or not, but... Uh, there's this idea that through the BJ Tech stuff, you'll see that, that on the on the Scam Binance site. What I know for sure is this, and this is what I posted in a follow-up thread in response to CZ, which is that um, you can look up a lot of public registries for corporations in various countries. Some of them don't work very well, some of them you have to pay for, but uh, there are two major European subsidiaries of Binance, the ones that basically run most of the European operations, I believe. They're registered in Malta. The only director of those is Guan Ying Chen. Um, there are other uh, uh, companies outside China. There's, a, there's an important company called Sigma. It might just be called Sigma AG, but um, you can look that up too. But it's re registered in Switzerland. It's a trading firm. It's believed to be the market maker for Binance US, meaning <laughs> it does the wash trading. It buys and sells on Binance and helps keep the market liquid um, on Binance US. That company is owned by Guan Ying Chen. I mean, these are public documents. So that, again, even if you have the excuse that, hey, we're a fast-growing company, which they say, we've had this chaotic corporate history, we, we've found ourselves scattered over the world kind of beyond our own, uh, without our own, beyond our own volition almost. Uh, they're like refugees from China. Um, even so... Why is this person who they seem very eager to not talk about or to at least and to now paint in a very certain light? 
why does this person own these non-Chinese companies? It, it doesn't really make sense. And if this person is supposed to own these companies, if she is an executive or, or a founder or someone really senior, why not just say that? Uh, so I still find it very odd. And as far as I know, this person is still an administrator of some sort, not a, a, a senior employee at Binance. They work for Binance still. So that's that's basically it. There may be other jurisdictions in which um, there are Binance subsidiaries or, or related companies that Guanyin Chen is uh, uh, some sort of uh, director of. I don't know yet. Um, I also should say that you know Binance is being investigated in at least a dozen, maybe two dozen countries by various regulators, and including the U.S. by you name the the regulator or department, and so, and by and CZ personally. And this company Sigma, the Swiss market maker was mentioned in a Wall Street Journal article. That's one of the few references you'll ever see in mainstream media to Guanyin Chen, which is that in that, I believe is in that Wall Street Journal article, they say this company and, and one or two others related to Binance US and CZ are being investigated by the DOJ, I think, and the SEC. And they mentioned Guanyin Chen as the president, I believe. So that, honestly, that that's really it. But it says a lot, I think. And their reaction says a lot too. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. The idea that this this one little tweet from you asking this question that they quite frankly should come to expect at this point, right? Uh, completely sets off like uh, this is like a running theme lately. Literally, the past couple of episodes, there's been instances where this has come up. But it's like that meme where like my my shirt that says I do not engage in human trafficking uh forces like a lot of people are asking me about whether i engage in human trafficking due to the t-shirt um that's like an ongoing thing with crypto companies where like they get themselves in this position uh, and then they question like where are all these questions why are there all these people looking into what we literally just put ourselves into that would obviously force people to ask questions about it like yeah. there, there, there are like ramifications here. Like I, people should understand, it's not just like, oh, we want to know who this person is. And you brought up like the issue of like we don't want to dox anyone. And right, if this was just a low level uh, employee at any company, uh, there would be no reason really to look into them. But the fact of the matter is, this is someone on the paperwork uh, listed as the head of the largest crypto exchange on the planet. We're talking a lot of money here. And then of course, legal ramifications. If, everyone, if anyone was, going, was to want to go after any, uh, you know, Binance or any of these various offshoots that you mentioned, um, who's responsible? And according to the documentation, this woman, Guanyang Chen, is the one responsible. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I a couple of thoughts about that. One. Yeah, it's not just about solving a mystery. I mean, it's solving a mystery that's that's important because this is the biggest exchange in the world and it's important to know who owns what and there's no real mandatory disclosure here. So, uh, you know, just for the sake of who's managing this and who controls it, who owns it, who, who has the power, that that's necessary for the public to know. But also, yeah, people are trying to sue Binance. Uh, my co-author Ben McKenzie and I wrote a story for the Washington Post. There are others out there about people trying to sue Binance, uh, usually in class action cases. And it's hard when you don't know where a company is based. They try to refer people to this uh, court of arbitration in Hong Kong. It's very expensive to, to do that. Um, so there are also law firms investigating Binance to try to figure out where they're located in terms of where their corporate registrations are, who some of these people like Wan Ying Chen are, and who should be named in lawsuits and who deserves to have you know, at least a uh, uh, liability, perhaps, if there is a legal situation. So that that's why people want to know. Um, I, I think the previous thing you said about PR is, is important, actually, because like one, they should have expected this question for a long time. Two, I, I think you know, I don't want to be a snob, but like, there are a lot of good crypto journalists, and and I would be glad to name one, name them and praise them, but. You know, a lot of crypto media is not so good and a lot, you know, your CNBC type stuff or whatever. I mean, it's usually sort of like bright, shiny object number go up kind of stuff. And or the New York Times has had some some stumbles for sure. But um, 
and in general, the information environment beyond even journalism is like dominated by a lot of really sort of credulous news outlets that are basically not news and all these influencers and fake Twitter accounts and stuff. So like, I think there are a couple things here going on here. One, the crypto companies aren't really used to bad press or, or real questions or like journalists annoying them with real questions. You know, someone from Bloomberg might call and start probing around or, you know, there are exposés. The New York Times is doing a good job on cracking right now. Um, so there's definitely stuff out there, but you know, CZ gives interviews all the time and it's usually towards these like, uh, you know, crypto potato or whatever, you know, crypto slate, these, these companies, I mean, I don't know if he's talked to those, but he goes on CNBC and these other, and these other outlets too. And they don't ask him any hard questions. They don't ask him who Guan Yung Shen is. Um, so that's part of it. The other thing I've noticed is frankly, um, and this is where maybe I will be a little obnoxious, but like a lot of these companies aren't that good at PR. I don't know if they think they don't need it or they're not that experienced or they are so confident in their missions. Uh, they really do b seem to believe in Bitcoin or crypto or decentralized finance or whatever sort of prosperity they're spreading or whatever money they're making. So, I mean, I get DMs sometimes from CEOs and that surprises me a lot. Uh, <laughs> And these guys don't even say, hey, can we talk off the record? They just sometimes say things. Um, you know, it's not like I have the keys to the kingdom, but like I just never thought I'd be in this position. And I am surprised at the things that people do that other industries wouldn't do. Um, and maybe I'm giving the game away a little bit, but it's their, you know, it's their choice. And, and um, you know, these people aren't idiots. I mean, a lot of them are, are quite smart, but... And some of them come from serious PR or communications backgrounds, but still, yeah, there, there, there are things that crypto does and how it relates to the public and how it tries to deal with journalists and especially influencers, which obviously I'm not, but um, that you don't really see the same kind of behavior or even risk taking in other industries, I'd argue. And maybe that oh. is because crypto is a very risk tolerant industry. Right. Right. No, that's definitely. I mean, that also goes back to how they sort of portrayed it in uh, Binance, portrayed it in their um, uh, statement to your question where they tried to claim that, you know, the distrust comes from xenophobia or racism about, you know, CZ being a Chinese businessman or uh, uh, Binance possibly being a Chinese company. No, the reason people don't trust uh Binance is the same reason people don't trust any crypto company at this point because you're yeah. in you're because you're a cryptocurrency company yeah. and the industry is rife with with uh I mean the literal name of this show is scam economy the yeah. entire uh industry is rife with scams like from the Absolutely. top to the bottom and, and um yeah that's and, why and, people don't trust you <laughs> and and cz often you know tweets you know very nice idealistic things about how customers come first and protecting customers and all that but look like i've talked to a number of people who are suing binance in various in different cases or are trying to sue binance um and not one of them is suing binance to find out if it's a chinese company or if it's controlled by the chinese intelligence or whatever I mean, I'm sure they want to know the, the nature of its ownership. No, they're, they're suing Binance because they lost money because the app went down during a market, uh, during a, a price crash, and they couldn't get out of their position. And that seemed rather convenient, given that prices were crashing. Things like that. Or, you know, I, I mean, I've heard some other stories. I, I don't mean to be coy, but I can't really share. But, like, you know, th these companies, not just Binance, but a lot of exchanges, they're, the stories are legion of people not being able to get their money out, not being able to execute the trades they want, having horrible customer service, and, and, and worse, and you just have to go on Reddit, you don't have to believe all of it, but you can you can see it every day. So, you know, it, it's not about a conspiracy of, of you know, is Chinese some, I mean, is Binance some Chinese political entity, really? It's about, like, how do you kind of nail down, and I mean it just in the sense of, like, keeping it in one place, in one jurisdiction, the most influential crypto company in the world so that it can be accountable, so that you know where it is, so that it can respond to customer complaints. They only have a phone line you can call. And so that people can sue it if need be to hold it accountable. Um, that stuff just doesn't happen. And that's why ultimately you need to know who Guan Ying Chen is. Oh, absolutely. And I do want to just add, because as the, the, the gears are turning in my head, um, maybe if you're trying to prove that you're not a Chinese company and don't have any connection to China, and I know there's an asterisk that we could put next to Hong Kong. But maybe the best thing isn't when someone tries to sue you, you say, 
we'll see you in Hong Kong arbitration court then. Like, you know, come on. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, there's certainly ties back there, I think. Uh, I can't speak that specifically to them. But, like, yeah, the stories that are told sometimes by these exchanges can be selective. And certainly one of the stories told about regulation in just a more, not, not even in any criminal sense, it's just that, like, Oh, the, the you know regulators haven't caught up with us, so we're sort of forced to be offshore, or semi-nomadic, or something like that. Um, you know, obviously that's not really true at this point, but it is more profitable to be offshore, and you can see the self-interest in it. Right. So, Jacob, your question has brought us ever so close, probably the closest anyone's ever got to finding out and solving this mystery of exactly who Guanyang Chen is and what is her relation to the company. Um, you know, maybe their version of events will will end up becoming closer to the truth. Maybe they'll be extremely far from the truth. We don't yet have all the answers set in stone. But um, whatever we end up finding out, without a doubt, your question and their response to your question will end up being a, a crucial piece that solves this mystery in the end. So thank you so much for joining me on the show. Jacob Silverman, everybody. He is a journalist currently writing a book on cryptocurrency with actor Ben McKenzie. Uh, Jacob, where could people find you online? And if there's anything else you want to promote, maybe an upcoming article or anything, uh, uh, feel free. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you. Um, I'm on Twitter as Silverman Jacob and fairly addicted. And uh, I have some other contact info on there. Trying to focus on still writing and finishing this book. But, you know, I'll, I'll have articles and uh, in the future and some maybe something soon. And uh, I think Ben and I will have some other projects uh, pretty soon down the road, too. So, um, yeah, reach out. I think it's a fascinating mystery, to be honest. And, you know, if anyone knows anything, just reach out to me or one of the other people who started asking about it. Thanks. Sounds great. And I hope uh, you and you and Ben will come on when uh, your book's closer to coming out. That will be a lot of fun to talk about. Looking forward to reading it as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'd love to. Like Jacob said, there is much more here, but we are closer and closer to solving this caper, right? And uh, of course, Scam Economy will stay on this story as new material, new reporting comes out. Until then, you can support this show by going to patreon.com slash mapbinder and becoming a paying subscriber. Your support helps grow this show, helps support my other work, like the other podcast I host, Doomed with Matt Binder, which you can check out at doomedcast.com, and of course, at the YouTube channel, where the Scam Economy YouTube videos are as well, youtube.com slash mattbinder. Check out the Twitch channel at twitch.tv slash mapbinder. And if you are an Amazon Prime subscriber, connect your Amazon Prime account to your Twitch account, and Amazon gives you a free Twitch Prime subscription every month. That means you basically, at no extra cost to you, get to give a paid subscription to one of your favorite Twitch creators each month. Again, if you can't throw down the extra couple of bucks every month at patreon.com slash mapbinder, this is a great way to support this show by taking advantage of a subscription to Amazon that you already have. It really costs you nothing extra. You make Amazon give uh, your favorite Twitch creator a little extra cut from the subscription you pay Amazon. I'm hoping you use that Twitch Prime subscription to subscribe to me. That's why I'm telling you about it. But listen, just give it to someone on Twitch that you enjoy. Uh, I mean, don't let it go to waste and let Amazon keep those extra couple of bucks, right? You can go to scameconomy.com for the links to the podcast version of this show. You could listen to it right there on the website. You can get the link to Apple Podcasts. You get the link to Spotify, Google Play, wherever you listen to podcasts. And of course... Please, if you haven't done so yet and have a few minutes, go to Apple Podcasts, go to Spotify, leave a review. Your review helps people find this show because your review helps boost this show's place in the Apple Podcasts and Spotify podcast charts. Follow me on Twitter at Matt Binder. Follow this show on Twitter at Scam Economy. And with all that said, I will see you all next time in the scam economy. Yeah.